but we would like to start with our panel on Wicked. Uh, we are still waiting for one more panelist, Alice Munya from Kenya, but she has to run between different sessions between because her permanent secretary was held up and he's still not here, so she has to deputize also for him. But she will join us uh, sooner or later. We have a very distinguished panel of experts. I suppose you recognize most of them. To my right is Vint Cerf, who does not to need to be introduced. And to his right is Jeff Houston, the chief scientist of uh, APNIC. And to my left, I have uh, Dick Baird from the United States Department of State. And to his left, uh, Franklin from the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And to the very left, we have Bill Drake, who is also well known in these circles, a US academic who lives in Switzerland. Uh, I will, we are, as we are late, uh, I, we are officially scheduled to finish by 6 o'clock, but I think we can run a little bit later, maybe 6.15 or so. And uh, without much further ado, I would like to ask Vint to introduce the subject, please. So, uh, dearly beloved, we are gathered here, I'm sorry, wrong. Wrong notes. Uh, so it's obvious that this crowd cares a great deal about what happens to the Internet when it comes up against regulations that are ill-suited to its operation. And so we're here to discuss specifically the potential for uh, the ITRs to interfere with the best quality operation of the internet and more generally the question about regulation and how it should be formulated so let me start by arguing that we should have a principle that says the stakeholders who are affected by regulation should have something to say about it before those regulations are adopted the second thing channel two channel two the second thing is that of course nobody can hear that if you're not on the right channel The second thing is that we should be respectful of the architecture of the Internet when we think about regulation. It's a layered structure, and we can have big arguments about what the layers should be and whether there is a, a, a strong boundary or a kind of porous boundary between the layers. But the point I want to make is don't regulate for the wrong reason. So, for example, the ITRs should be confined to carrying bits from one place to another. That's an important function. That's something we want to make sure will work. You need it in order to move packets around in the Internet. But that's the wrong place to worry about things like content. And to attempt to regulate, control, or intervene in content or application space when you're down moving bits around or packets around is simply the wrong thing to do. It's inefficient and it has side effects and collateral damage which can affect everyone. It can affect us personally in our use of the net. It can affect business models. It can affect inter, uh, you know, cross uh, cross border uh, issues. And so, being thoughtful about where that regulation applies and for what purpose is very important. And finally, to keep uh, my opening remarks very short, we absolutely have to analyze what the effects of regulation are going to be before we adopt them. One of the worst things that can happen is to discover that the side effects of a regulation are so damaging that it destroys the very system that we're trying to support and enhance and evolve. So we should be thoughtful not only upon adopting regulations, but periodically or continuously there should be attention paid to what are the side effects. Part of the reason this is so important is that we live in an environment where the technology is changing all the time new technologies come along, the advent of mobile technology attached to the Internet or able to reach the Internet was very transforming. It meant that the information window that you used to have in your mobile or, your, or in your laptop or your desktop was now with you at all times. And that changes the way in which the Internet is used. It changes the way in which communications is supported. 
So we have a lot of work to do in the near term with regard to the World Conference on International Telecommunications. And in the longer term, these issues are going to arise over and over again. We have to find a way forward that preserves the Internet's utility and allows it to continue to evolve. I'll stop there, Mr. Chairman, and uh, invite the next speaker. Thank you very much. Bill? Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, sorry for the rather chaotic uh, uh, conditions uh, with everything running late. I just want to point out uh, before I begin my five minutes that um, in case you're not aware, tomorrow morning at 9.30, uh, there will be the main session on critical Internet resources in the main hall. I will be co-moderating that session and we will spend about an hour or so on the wicket and the international telecommunication regulations there as well so if you're interested in this issue you have a second opportunity as well tomorrow which might be perhaps starting on time and hopefully a little bit less uh, chaotic so okay there are of course many many things that can be said about this subject it's a it's a topic of great concern and has received an enormous amount of uh, publicity in recent times and it's been the source of a lot of divisive debate. I don't want to, in my few moments here, start to plunge into the details of any particular set of proposals, although I imagine we can do that in the question and answer period. I'd like to speak just briefly to three kind of meta points, because uh, I'm a meta kind of guy that I think are kind of overarching uh, questions that have arisen in the context of the debate. The first one is the relationship between the existing international telecommunication regulations and the Internet's development. I raise this point because you may have seen the point come up a number of times in discussions. Uh, the assertion has been made that the ITRs are somehow responsible for the Internet's development, that they had a catalytic effect on it and so on. And I think it's worth just recognizing how this works. At the last revision of the International Telecommunication Regulations in Melbourne in 1988, WATSI 88 as that was called, um, there was a long struggle over Article 9. And Article 9 was a revision of long-standing language, most recently included in the 1982 convention, that held that members could authorize their administrations recognize private operating agencies and others to enter into relationships that were outside the ambit of the main focus of the international regulations. In, in uh, Melbourne, that article was expanded to take in, on board a recognition that we were in a world of liberalization and privatization, that uh, many large companies were building uh, global private networks and, in, and uh, enhanced value networks, as we would call them in the United States, value-added networks abroad that merged computing and telecommunications. And there was an effort to try to ensure that this whole terrain of digital communications was going to remain outside the focus of the whole accounting and settlement system and everything else that is the main guts of the ITRs. And so the language that was adopted said that members could authorize uh, administrations, RPO, uh, recognized private operating agencies, and any other organization or person to enter into special arrangements with counterparts abroad subject to national law for establishment of special networks, systems, or applications, including the underlying means of telecom transport to meet their own communication needs or those of others. So there you have the notion then that these new kinds of digital um, networks and also the applications that ride over them should remain essentially unregulated. Um, and members did that, uh, as I say, focusing in a really on, in a pre-internet kind of world on the kind of computer, computing platforms and digital communications that were popular then in the private sector. This also led to the liberalization in the ITU of recommendation D50, uh, or D1, sorry, which for a long time had regulated tightly the operation of leased circuits and private networks. Um, so this has often been cited then as having been a big catalyst of the internet and indeed um, some have argued uh, that quote all internet traffic moves under article 9. Um, 
I, some in Geneva, I will say. Um, I would just like to point out that, um, you know, personally, I don't, I, I'm not an ISP, and I don't know what kind of conversations they enter into, but I rather doubt that when ISPs are deciding how to peer and interconnect, they sit around together and they say, well, wait, is this permissible under Article 9 of the uh, International Telecommunication Regulations? Oh, yes, it is. Let's peer. Uh, I, I don't think it's really the case. So while the ITRs did not impede the development of the Internet, and indeed by liberalizing lease circuits may have facilitated it in some way, it's a bit of a stretch to suggest that the ITRs are in any way responsible for the Internet's development. Secondly, I'd like to raise the question of the, the relationship between the revision of the ITRs and Internet governance, because this has been contested as well. Some have argued that there is no relationship at all. The ITRs are not about Internet governance. Nobody who's concerned about Internet governance should be worried about it. Indeed, I've had people say to me, why are you doing this panel when there's no relationship between the two? Now, if you stick to the narrow definition of Internet governance that people tended to use before the WSIS uh, process began, where you think of Internet governance as pertaining just to the, the Internet names and numbers that are managed through ICANN and the RIRs, you can say, yes, there's no live proposals on the table now that would transfer functions from ICANN or otherwise impede uh, the operation of the Internet naming and numbering system, so therefore there's no relationship. But of course, the whole process of the WSIS and the IGF has been in part about taking a broader view. We adopted a definition in the Tunis Agenda uh, for the Information Society of Internet governance that said it is the whole range of principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures, and programs that shape the underlying Internet and its use for information communication and commerce. And so the point is Internet governance is much broader than names and numbers. So imagine then if you do get international multilateral regulatory treatment of the internet through a treaty does that then constitute internet governance i could there are three quick scenarios i would mention one if you have expansive redefinitions of terms adopted as has been proposed during the the council working group process that would for example build into the notion of telecommunications and processing which suggests you know any kind of digital information processing or you know, and ICTs, then it would be effectively the case that the entire ITRs and all their various provisions would be applying to the internet. Um, similarly, if you apply the ITRs to all operating agencies of any sort and not just recognized operating agencies providing traditional telecommunications, again, you get this kind of expansion. So then all the language about mandatory standards, defining spam and fraud, routing security, uh, quality of service, fair mutual compensation for inter interconnection, and so on that's been suggested by various parties would become, indeed, uh, Internet governance provisions. Uh, another scenario is that th those provisions don't get added in, that those, la those uh, proposals are not accepted. But nevertheless, uh, you get uh, parties who say, well, let's put some individual proposals in. We put in some cybersecurity language. Well, then those dimensions of Internet governance would be included. Or thirdly, and this is, a, the, I guess, a key point, neither of the above may happen. But then what about if governments begin to say, well, we believe that the existing definition of telecommunications in international arrangements already covers the Internet anyway, and therefore we're going to apply these provisions to the Internet in our domestic and bilateral relationships with other correspondents. The result of that could be a sort of patchwork pattern of global Internet governance. So I guess, and I'll close by saying that last point points to my third point, which is, there's a longer term question that has to be addressed about convergence. Public switch telephone networks are moving to become IP core networks. Everything's being reconfigured on an IP basis. And so even if you want to say, as I happen to want to say, that the ITR should not cover internet governance, it should not cover the internet, there are unanswered questions that we're going to have to deal with over the longer term. How do you draw boundary lines? We have different solutions in different countries. In America, we call the Internet an application under federal communication rules. Other countries have different approaches. And at some point, the differences between those approaches may become more manifest, raise more issues. And the question is, do we just kind of say, 
it's too much hassle to try to get into this. Let's just ignore the problem and not put anything into any international, international agreements because it may do more damage than good, which is sort of what they did in the WTO. Or do we try to tackle these questions? I imagine they're going to come up again at the World Telecom Policy Forum and elsewhere. It's a long-term problem that we need to think about. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And uh, in the interest of time, I kept on my introductory remark. But one thing I did want to say, we have tried to set up a very balanced panel. And we have, I think, geographical balance. Unfortunately, not much of gender balance. But we also invited representatives of the ITU. We reached out to the chairman of the preparatory process and also to the host country, United Arab Emirates. But unfortunately, for various reasons, uh, we were not able to have them on the panel. Okay, now over to uh, Alice Munya, and let me check on your exact title. You are chair of the Kenya uh, Internet Governance Steering Committee, from, uh, which is under the Ministry of Information and Communications. Please, Alice. Um, thank you very much, uh, Marcus, uh, and uh, to Bill for organizing this uh, workshop and for inviting us. Uh, I've been hoping between several workshops because our permanent secretary, Dr. Vitang Demo, who should have been here, has been delayed, and so uh, apologies for the delay. Um, I, th I was asked to uh, present Kenya's position on uh, Wikit and ITRs, but the first thing I'll say is Kenya hasn't developed a position yet because we are still yet to hold uh, a multi-stakeholder meeting uh, that involves all stakeholders uh, so that we are able to develop what we are calling a national position. Uh, and a few of the stakeholders, including industry, I think Fiona and the rest are in this room and they can add on uh, uh, to uh, some of the points I'm going to be making. However, Kenya has been involved in all the preparatory process, the regional preparatory processes that have taken place. Three meetings to date. The last one was in Ghana, uh, and we developed what you're calling the African Common Proposals. Uh, we've supported them so far, uh, although that doesn't mean that uh, we, have support, we are supporting and perhaps endorsing them at that level, but that means that they have to come to the national level and be discussed because our con there's a constitutional provision that ensures that any... Uh, policy developed or any uh, when the government actually gets involved in any treaty making decision it has to be subjected uh, to a multi-stakeholder discussion so that we can develop a national position so I am going to actually present what the African common proposal some of them uh, and uh, in other instances I'll present Kenya's uh, you know real not really position but you know co in comparison to for example what is currently at the national level which would probably make it difficult uh, to support some of the proposals or not, though not all of them so we support and I think we held uh, an ITR workshop during the East African IGF this year we support the changes related to the I uh, ITRs have to uh, have to take place um, because of the expansion in significance of telecommunication, in data, the liberalization of markets, uh, obviously the emergence of new businesses and the emergence of dominance of, of IP or IP networks. Also, we support the revision because there's been convergence between formally separate uh, communication media and also uh, technology and, and business structure and, and financial arrangement, which is a big issue for most African states. So some of the proposals, for example, uh, price regulation uh, and roaming uh, in particular, uh, at the national level, uh, you know, the African Common Proposal is uh, proposing, uh, you know, caps uh, on retail and whole prices, roaming, uh, as well as uh, uh, discretion of national governments uh, in the uh, context of uh, bilateral and regional arrangements. Uh, well. At the national level, what we, we've done is encouraged operators to take measures that enhance, for example, enhance consumer awareness, uh, also uh, addressing structural barriers that, that increase costs by, by ensuring, for example, that the government is actually uh, putting money and resources towards develop, expanding our broadband network. Uh, so price resort, for, for example, has been uh, our last resort and having sat on the regulatory body uh, for nearly six years, it was our last resort out of frustration in noticing that uh, the prices were not coming down, both in terms of accessing the internet, but there are diff different ways, for example, being part of the, the Kenya IXP. So, uh, and going further, our regulatory framework is technology neutral, so I think we would 
automatically and generally be supporting a an idea that are technology neutral. Uh, on the issue of fraud uh, and number misuse and calling line identity, another common African common position where many African states are concerned about. Um, and, I th and fraud is defined as, as criminal in our own uh, jurisdiction, although we haven't actually defined exactly what cybercrime, uh, cybercrime, and we are currently developing a cybercrime framework, uh, so that is going to, 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 to come up at the national level. But I think, and that it's been said by our permanent secretary and minister uh, quite often, that the preference would be uh, to instead increase international collaboration on, on dealing with cybercrime. Uh, develop cybercrime frameworks at the national level, but also increase uh, uh, international collaboration uh, and cooperation on that. Uh, another issue is spam. Um, and we at the national level find it, you know, uh, spam is actually is, is an issue, although it hasn't become such a major issue uh, in a way that has uh, led to discussions, and again, uh, my colleagues in industry can, uh, can speak to this. But the danger of that, again, from our perspective, is that it will be going more towards uh, content uh, regulation, which we have started, but only at the broadcast level, and that's because, of, of course, of our past history. Uh, so it, will, it would mean, uh, beginning ag again, uh, looking at revising um, content regulation at that national level and ma making it expand uh, beyond uh, broadcast. Um, I think those are the main ones, the cyber security, spam, uh, price regulation that are the main, uh, the main issues for the, uh, for, for the African states, uh, which are obviously currently supported by Kenya and until and, and, and when uh, we develop our own uh, national position. Thank you. Thank you, Alice, and uh, I think it deserves to be emphasized that Kenya really makes admirable efforts to working with all stakeholders in multi-stakeholder cooperation. This also allows me to make a commercial for a report which is launched, a country case study on Kenya which you can find on our website, which describes very much the policies in place in Kenya. And with that, we move over to another country which has an excellent multi-stakeholder cooperation at the national level, Brazil. Franklin Silvanetto, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for the invitation to take part in this uh, workshop. Uh, when I was invited to, to take part, it was uh, made very clear that I could take part here uh, a, as an, an informal position, or I could also choose the opportunity to have an official position. And then you would allow me to diplomatically be exactly in the middle <laughs> and uh, to use the opportunity to informally talk about the uh, Brazilian official position to the... To and, and why am I going to take this opportunity uh, for that? Because I see that uh, in, the, in the two days here in, in IGF, since I arrived yesterday and uh, along the whole day today, there is a huge interest, not only in the Brazilian position, I, I think uh, uh, there is a, a, a huge interest in the participants of this forum on what uh, countries, and especially some countries, are, uh, are thinking and how they are preparing their positions to, to wicket. And then I would like to, to, to take this opportunity to, to m make very clear some points of the Brazilian position, which I think will uh, respond to many of the people who uh, approached me and other members of the uh, Brazilian delegation regarding uh, the positions to wicket. Um, the Brazilian final position, uh, uh, like is the case of Kenya, is not yet... Uh, set in all the, the, the complete array of issues because we are holding a very comprehensive national process of consultations with all stakeholders involved to uh, prepare uh, the positions to the, to the conference. And then uh, I, uh, I see that this is already an, an influence from the internet environment to the telecommunications environment because now we have a multi-stakeholder preparation for a, a telecommunications conference in Brazil. And as the same way as people say that uh, the internet runs on Article 9, I, we could say that the opposite is also happening. Uh, and this process, I can come to more detail later if it's, it's in the interest of the, of, of the audience. 
uh, but uh, it is open to all, uh, every and all citizen of Brazil, you, they can participate either via an internet or via weekly meetings that take place in Brasilia in the Anatel, which is the uh, regulatory agency of Brazil, which is in charge of preparing the position for the conference. I mentioned this to uh, uh, let it clear from, from scratch, from the start, that uh, the, uh, the position that will be reflected in, in, in Dubai will be a multi-stakeholder position in Brazil. So we, we, uh, this is a very difficult exercise, but we want to reflect that a position that's not only uh, from governments, but also from the private sector and from the civil society. And uh, uh, we also think that there are many aspects in the ITRs that should be, uh, 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 should be updated. Of course, it's obvious to say that in 1998, for example, people did not use to carry their phones abroad. And how they do because they have cell phones. And then this question of roaming, uh, thinking on the, public, uh, uh, on the public interest of the conference from the Brazilian perspective is a very important issue. Uh, and uh, the proposals that Brazil is going to, 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 to and is presenting to the conference, uh, most of them have to, to do with this uh, rating and tariffing aspects of the ITRs, especially regarding roaming. But now, do, uh, does the conference has anything to do with internet governance, which is the, 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 the question here? Well, I would start um, my initial remarks, and then we, we also com could come in more detail later. Uh, it, uh, this is a very important question, because in 1998, when we had the, the ITRs signed, we still do not ha did not have the actual uh, definition of internet governance which was uh, crafted and drafted by the uh, working group that uh, uh, worked between the two sessions of WISIS. And then if you uh, compare uh, the definition of Internet governance, when they say that it's rules and norms that uh, 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 sort of shape the, the, the functioning of the Internet, and if you think the Internet on this classical layered uh, structure, uh, you see that uh, telecommunications has much to do with the infrastructure layer. And then from that perspective, uh, I would say that uh, it, is, it, it is possible that there are some issues uh, related to Internet governance and to Internet that uh, also have to do with ITU issues. Uh, we should not, not also forget that ITU is one of the facilitators of the action line number five uh, of WISIS. But and this is a, 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 an important point. But here I'm talking about ITU and Internet governance, not about WICKET and Internet governance. Because when we consider specifically the conference, uh, Brazil sees uh, this conference as an opportunity to update or to redraft uh, the ITRs, but also to have a treaty of principles. Not a treaty that will come into the very specific details of the, of the questions. And then, in this sense, uh, we consider that the, uh, the, 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 the result of the conference would be a text that would deal specifically with the, I would say, traditional elements of telecommunications. And here there is an, an important point, because also within Brazil, uh, legally, we have a norm that we call uh, informally as Norm 4 that separates telecommunications from uh, ICTs. And then, uh, even legally, you cannot have uh, this uh, uh, approach at the conference to bring the concepts and the issues of ICTs into the concept of telecommunication. Uh, this is a very important aspect, which is not very well known, and then I'm taking this opportunity to, 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 uh, to make this uh, better known, because this will shape the, uh, the whole preparation of Brazil to the conference. Uh, I, I think it's important to mention as well because Veit said something very important this morning. In the, because the Internet is much more than the computers or the software. The Internet is a concept. The Internet is a, a, a design. And this design and this concept were already valid in 1988. So they, I think they remain valid today. And so the IT, if the ITRs in 1988 did not specifically deal with some issues that uh, today we consider Internet governance as such, uh, maybe this is one of, uh, of the principles that we could uh, also have as a guide when defining positions to the conference. Uh, 
uh, then I, I think this is are my initial remarks and I, I'm ready for the questions and for the debate afterwards. Thank you, Franklin, for that. And now over to Dick Baird for the U.S. position, please. Uh, thank you very much, Marcus. It's a pleasure to be here today and uh, with my colleagues uh, on this panel and particularly with my friend Vince Cerf. I would like to note uh, that we, are, uh, we have among us uh, Mr. El Ghanim uh, from the United Arab Emirates who will be chairing the uh, World Conference on in International Telecommunications. And Mr. El Ghanim, if you could kindly raise your hand and thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. And uh, we want to thank you very much for your service and look forward to. Uh, uh, to seeing you in Dubai. Uh, let me begin, first of all, by um, indicating um, that uh, I'm not going to engage in the debate as to whether or not the 1988 uh, ITRs were the foundation uh, for the Internet, uh, but I will say, as, as our submission on August 3rd indicated, uh, that it was a foundation uh, that enabled uh, and facilitated the growth of the Internet. Uh, but what must be absolutely clear to all of us is uh, that uh, the Internet grew up in a multi-stakeholder environment. And uh, we cannot uh, forget about the work of uh, the uh, Internet um, Engineering Task Force, uh, the uh, World Wide Web, the ICANN, the regional uh, integrate re uh, registries, and so forth that grew up during this period and it certainly facilitated uh, and made possible uh, the Internet as we know it today. Uh, but it is important, uh, nonetheless, uh, to speak about the ITRs and their importance uh, from the point of view of a foundation for the environment we have today. Again, having said that, what the United States seeks in the revision of the ITRs is to maintain the distributed nature of what we have come to know as this environment, uh, distributed nature of the Internet, uh, and also to ensure that flexibility is continues to be built into the international telecommunications regulations uh, so that we don't um, have um, a situation in which the ITRs could uh, actually work against the continuing uh, evolution uh, of the Internet environment. And I would look at that in a very broad sense to include, uh, for me at least, the phrase, the Internet economy. So the question becomes for us then, and I want to share with you, um, is what is the U.S. position? Um, and um, I want to summarize our position in a few uh, principles. Uh, first of all, um, we want to maintain minimal uh, changes to the preamble to the 1988 uh, ITRs. Uh, this is important uh, because uh, the only change that we actually seek to make uh, is a one-word change uh, from supplement to complement, that the ITRs complement uh, the Constitution <laughs> and the Convention uh, of the ITU. But buried in that uh, preamble, and very importantly, is a fundamental principle, which is that the sovereign right of each country to regulate its telecommunications is fully uh, recognized. The second principle that is embodied there is that the ITU should promote the development of telecommunications services and their most efficient operation uh, while harmonizing the development of facilities for worldwide telecommunications. Um, and importantly, this is a reference to international telecommunications. I start here because um, this is where, I, if I may so suggest, you begin. And I like to always bring my ITRs because I think people are often, let me put it this way, this is probably the most talked about and debated document in the world, which is also perhaps the least read document in the world. Uh, but it is, if you read it, it is something that I believe in its own technical way in its own moment in 1988, achieved a precision uh, and a kind of summary of what is important or what was important at that time 
And it is our goal in, the, in Dubai to try to maintain that high level, that high standard. And by, we will do that by, of course, maintaining uh, the document at a very high level of principles. It is the United States' goal to maintain the standard of the 1988 ITRs, which consist of nine pages of treaty text. And we wish also to try to come away from Dubai with only nine pages of treaty text. So our principles. First, don't change the preamble uh, of the ITRs, but with that one exception. Uh, secondly, it's terribly important to remember that the ITRs should align with the Constitution and the Convention uh, of the ITU, because the Constitution and Convention lays out very explicitly what is the mandate of the ITR, I, I, the ITU. So the two documents should be always kept in alignment and that's the second goal of the United States. Thirdly, the world of telecommunications is an ever-changing one. It is different in the ITU from the radio world, in which you have radio regulations that are revised every three to four years. It is very important for us to maintain that difference. Whereas we talk in the radio side about regulation, we talk in the telecommunications side about recommendations. Those recommendations should remain voluntary, and we are going to be very sensitive to that in Dubai, that nothing in the ITRs should suggest that the recommendations on the telecommunications side should become mandatory. Fourthly, and this, is, I think, is a terribly important issue, and unfortunately it has a bit of granularity to it. It's a bit detailed, but I can't emphasize it enough as an issue that is going to determine the, the, our understanding of the ITRs as revised. The United States believes that we should use, continue to use the term recognized operating agency within the revised text of the ITRs. And what do we mean by that? That term is uh, found there, but it was also revised in 1988 by the ITU to, to, uh, to give us the definition of recognized operating agencies. And from our point of view, it has three components. First, a service is offered internationally. This is what the ITRs are talking about. It's only border to border. It, ITUs, ITRs do not reach into domestic regulation. It is border to border. Secondly, it talks about a telecommunications service which is offered to the public. We are not talking about private networks. And the third point, um, is, and then we maintain this in the, our revision of the 88 ITRs, uh, it is we recognize the right of administrations, read that, governments, to my words, but essentially a summary of 1.7 in the ITRs, to regulate or to license the provision of those services by recognized operating agencies. So we understand that that's the agency that we're talking about. That's the particular kind of operator that we are talking about. I don't have to emphasize that this, of course, keeps that kind of operator separate from a lot of the other kinds of uh, provision of, uh, of services, uh, uh, otherwise known as Internet services, that you, I know, are most interested in. But that's a very important point for the United States to emphasize what is the scope of the ITRs. It covers recognized operating agencies that has the characteristics that I have uh, described. Lastly, uh, we uh, propose changes to Article 6, which was the fundamental purpose of the ITRs in 1988, uh, which was to give a method by which uh, revenues could be settled in what kind of a world? In a world in which it was seen that there is a circuit. That circuit is divided at its midpoint, and that midpoint is between two operators. Those operators divide the minutes of traffic between them uh, and give a value to those uh, minutes, and then they divide the revenues. That's what the ITRs were principally about and what Article 6 was principally about. That does not work in today's world. That is not the world that we are talking about today, and we essentially eliminate artists, Article 6, and we talk about commercial arrangements. And those commercial arrangements should retain the flexibility to meet the obviously changing world uh, that uh, is a part 
uh, of our environment uh, today. So, <clears throat> in summary, that is the U.S. position, um, and I would be very pleased, uh, Mr. Chairman, to take any questions uh, on that position. Thank you. Thank you for that, and please, sir, accept our apologies. We obviously seem to have had some communication problem, but we would have been delighted to have you on the panel, and I would like to give you the opportunity to maybe say a few words from a host country perspective once we have made the first round of this panel. Last speaker, then, is Jeff Houston, as I said, Chief Scientist of the Asia-Pacific Network. Please, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Marcus, and uh, thank you all for coming. It's obviously a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm older than I feel, because I kind of feel that I'm a child of the Internet, because, of course, much of the last 30 years I've been totally absorbed in that particular technology and that particular framework and architecture. But I'm also old, and I remember 1988. I remember it bloody well. Computers were getting smaller. A few years before that, a decent computer would fill this room. But by 1988, you know, you could only fill about half the room with a decent computer. And as for telephony, they're all wired. The only way you ever had mobile telephony is you took this massive battery and this huge handset and stuck it in your car. Nothing fitted in your pocket. That was 1988. Just look at those 25 years. It's a computer. It's a telephone. It's a computer. It's a telephone. The industry has managed a massive transformation. Like all transformations, there are victims as much as there are winners. So I actually now want to look at telephony as an industry, because telephony was one half of this massive computing and um, communications industry of the 1980s. Everything was a network. The handsets were dumb pieces of plastic. They had a speaker and a microphone and a pulse generator. Everything happened in the network. There were calls, transactions. The directory was maintained by the network operator. There was a rich series of bilateral agreements that spanned the globe. There was this massive amount of money that got funneled. These were rich companies employing hundreds of thousands of people. British Telecom at its peak, I think, had 300,000 people on its books. These were giants, and everything was in the network. All we were were consumers, and they didn't call us that. We were subscribers. We couldn't even attach our own devices. That was the world of then. If you wanted to regulate that industry, would you try and regulate the handset manufacturer? Well, that's stupid. You'd regulate the network operator. So the whole ITRs reflected that architecture. Now, I have some stunning news for you, or maybe it's not stunning, maybe you've figured it out. Telephony is dead. That entire industry is dead. Firstly, we got rid of all the faxes, they became emails. And now we're getting rid of all the calls. Because between Skype and Vipe and this and that, it's all over IP. And all that's happening now is we're mimicking the residual functions of the PSTN, the switch telephony, at the application level. But all that switched virtual circuit, five ESSs, if I bought out a five ESS today and asked for bidders, none of you would bid a cent. It's useless. Yesterday's technology, it's dead. What did we replace it with? That was the trick, because the internet is the complete opposite of a network-centric model. This is a remarkable computer. It's faster, has more memory, and does a whole lot more than that room full of junk that I had back in 1988. All of a sudden, the network is nothing. The internet is so minimal, those 20 bytes of IP header, that if you strap it onto pigeons in Bergen in Norway, you still get a working connection because the network now does nothing. Everything is end-to-end. -end. Everything is between the computers at either end. So what of the network operators? Well, it's tough. There's no call. There's no transactions. I can't tell what you're doing. It's just bits. I'm just shoveling bits. And if you encrypt it, I have no idea what you're doing. So I can't charge you for it. I have no idea even where the packet's headed. My only job is to get rid of it from my network. And because the internet allowed a completely different model of interaction, 
and it was a market-based model, not a regulatory-inspired model. All of a sudden, I don't have to care where it's going. I just want to get rid of it off my network and get it closer to the edge. So all of a sudden, there's no settlements. There's no call accounting business. That rich fabric of money movement that was inside telephony vaporized. Telephony is dead. Dead. So what now? The aim in 1988 wasn't about regulating telephony. That's what came out. But what went in was a far more noble idea. The idea that we could create an international regulatory framework about telecommunications in general. But all we knew about was virtual circuits for telephony. And what came out was a set of regs that precisely and only defined telephony and nothing else. The business model of the internet is actually the business model about applications and services. It's about Microsoft, Apple, Google, and all the other panoply of folk, the Netflix and so on, who create content from computer to computer. There is no internet economy. There's a computer economy. It's not about the internet. It's actually about the apps and services that you and I create in software on computers. That's where the money is. Shoveling bits is different. So if you were going to create a set of regs today that talked about telecommunications in general and tried to fold in the internet, what would you end up with? I'd actually suspect all you'd have is the introduction. It's a wonderful thing and countries should encourage it. But after that, it's not the business of the bit shoveler. And all of the pressure that we've seen and in particular the stuff coming out of Etno about QoS reminds me of an old, a very old saying that when your business model is busted when other people are driving bulldozers through your poor ideas about networking tariffs when you've got something that just isn't working you've got two choices one, you can fix your business model you can actually create tariffs that work or two, you can claim that you were always right and the world is wrong, and if you could just get a regulatory change to change the world, your business model would be brilliant. But of course, appealing to one country to change the regulatory framework is a waste of time. Go for the lot in one go. And that's why we're seeing a lot of these dead and dying telephone network operators appealing to the highest body they know to change the environment to support a business plan that's basically busted. What we're really seeing is a bunch of folk fighting over the water remaining in the swamp. And these folk are dinosaurs. It's finished. It's over. And what we're seeing is they're thrashing tails. And I wish they'd go away. <laughs> there was a time, a little over a hundred years ago, when this newfangled thing called the telephone and tele telegraphy decided that the international regs of the International Postal Union weren't right. That it wasn't all just letters. There was a different way of doing it. They had a number of conventions and conferences and out of it came the ITU. They split the two models because it isn't the post, is it? Telephony doesn't work the way the postal system works. Why do we think that there's even a hope of trying to create a single regulatory environment that spans the ghost of telephony and the internet of today and tomorrow? Maybe it's time to try and understand what those people were really thinking 110 years ago. And maybe it's time to understand that in the world of the network, in the world where the computer and computing applications are everything and the rest is bit shoveling, maybe it's time to think about how we wish to organise our world and the instruments we need that perhaps are different from the ITU we have today. And in the same way as the ITU and the IPU managed what appears to be, 100 years later, a relatively reasonable settlement, Maybe it's time we try to do that again. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Before opening the floor for discussion, I wonder whether any of the panelists would like to react to what they heard from these introductory statements. Yes. 
uh, I like uh, Jeff's analogy very much, though my first reaction is being rolled over uh, on by a dying dinosaur is just as lethal and, and fatal, so uh, we need to get out of the way. Uh, I think you're right that we have a model that works, and it's been working for quite a while. We started out, one, one thing I think it's important to recognize is that when the Internet was first being constructed, it was a private network. It was the U.S. government that was building it and paying for it, but it was treated as a private network because dedicated private lines were being acquired and uh, equipment was, was supplied that was owned by the private network operator. Somewhere along the line, the telephone and cable operators decided that they wanted to be part of this game as well. And what is quite fascinating to me is that they were able to do it without any special regulation or anything else because they were no different than the rest of us except maybe they were bigger but they were allowed to engage in operating pieces of internet that was the theory behind the design anybody that could build a piece of it should be allowed to connect to somebody else if they were willing to do that purely bilateral agreements based on business decisions that were made by the by the parties and so I do find it rather fascinating that the Internet emerged out of this essentially non-regulated environment. And so we need to keep it that way because if we don't, it won't survive. Thank you. Yes, Franklin, please. I would just like to make a comment on the provocation made by, by uh, Bill Drake on if the... Uh, <coughs> If the ITRs are or not responsible for the internet, I mean, if does the internet run because of the ITRs? And then I would like to mention Tolstoy. He never heard of the internet. I'm sh not sure if he ever saw a, a telephone, but he knew a, a lot about wisdom. <coughs> and then in his War and Peace book, uh, at the end he asks, uh, "Why does a train move?" What's the answer? One can say, "No, the train moves because the driver." turn it on and move the leverage to the front. And then the other say, no, the train moves because it has a good coal that is burning and that's offering energy to it. And the other say, no, no, this train is moving because there is a schedule that he has to fulfill. And then <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the, the ITU does a tremendous, fantastic work. Brazil is a very active uh, participant of, of ITU. But... Uh, I answer with this about your provocation of the ITRs, if the internet moves because of the ITRs or not. Thank you. Are there other comments from the panel? Doesn't seem to be the case, but then I would... So, uh, no, I would like first give the floor to you, sir. Where do we have a row, row microphones? Do we have a microphone? Do we have microphones Maybe for speaks in? Come to the. Podium. Oh, go to, why, so why don't you come to the podium? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Well, uh, my name is Mohammed Ghanem, and I will be uh, after hearing all of what's what I've been hearing, and for the past almost a year. I'm now scared more than anything <laughs> to chair the conference. Um, but back in November, back in on October, we had uh, held a session in the uh, in Geneva. Uh, that was attended uh, by all the regional groups, which represents all the countries around the world. Which I assume some or many have done their own consultation within their country. Uh, the regional groups met many times. They have agreed to their uh, common proposals and they submit uh, the proposals to the ITU for the WICKED. Now WICKED is going to start on 3rd of December and I wish to see all of you guys in Dubai. I think um, Dick from the United States said something which is extremely important. I think we have been hearing so much about WICKED that we are talking about 11 articles, Dick, am I correct? 11 articles, 9 pages or 10 pages. Uh, and all the regional groups, uh, that's, 
that's coming from me as a chairman or hopefully the chairman of the of the conference I've have agreed that these articles will be high level principles all the regional groups agree to that and the regional groups in no way intended to get into details of packets or protocols or whatever that is actually reflected in uh, in uh, standards somewhere else so that's 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 important the second important uh, issue is before i attended the information meeting i was so worried that this conference is going to go nowhere but when we held our first information uh, informal session for all the regional groups the regional groups all of them was very very much working in a cooperative manner in order to reach consensus into what's going to be the outcome of the ITRs or the wicket but there is a positive atmosphere was in the room and i encourage the regional groups to continue after october meeting to work in order to reach to a successful uh, outcome of the conference that will not hinder the internet that will not hinder actually it will push internet and i'm not sure about whether itrs are the reasons behind the innovation of the internet or not uh, i think i think the internet has 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 uh, has grown so much uh, over, over the past years and we have seen so much of innovations um, I am I am I am so hopeful and I'm so um, happy out of the of the, of the meeting. I think um, the devil is in the details. I want to emphasize something. A lot of things, a lot of issues has been agreed in the information meeting. Hopefully there is a few but difficult issues still we need to work them until the 3rd of December. We have less than a month. But uh, hopefully we will have a successful meeting. I invite everybody to attend this meeting. My apology, I did not receive the invitation. Otherwise, I would love to be here and sitting with you in the panel. Uh, 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 our, our philosophy back home in the United Arab Emirates is that we are a country who always bring together nations. And we will continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, sir, and you think you can take the applause as a sign that we feel we're in safe hands. Uh, I understand that uh, Luigi Campadella would like to say a few words. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't know if it's working. Now that it's working, it's not working. Work now? Okay. Jeff, you have in front of you a dinosaurus. So you, I, I'm just here, so you are not lucky to have me he here. And it's very fascinating to listen to you because you mean you know all the solutions, you know the problem, you know everything. It's very, very interesting. And uh, I've listened what you have said. But apart from this uh, joke, um, I think that one thing that is very clear from this debate and what precisely Jeff has said, which is completely different from Vinton, that this system does not work. It's broken. It's broken. It's not sustainable. Jeff, the European telecom operators have invested this year 44 billion euro in the networks. Someone has to pay for this. Or, or we go for the Australian models, where, the st where we give back the, the network to the state and this used public money or we believe we continue to believe in the private sector in the private investment this is a choice we can discuss that but someone has to pay for the infrastructure now um, I, I um, would like also to um, ask uh, um, two questions to in particular to, to, to the two panelists, Richard and Franklin. Because here we should, uh, uh, unfortunately for us, this sector is heavily regulated, jo uh, uh, Jeff. You, you live in Australia, we live in Europe. I hope that 
I know that you visit Europe, and Europe is very different from Australia. And uh, uh, we are very, we are very, and 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 we believe that Europe is very competitive. You know, by the way, that the prices in Europe are less than half in the average of the price that there are for the access of the internet in the US, for example. But about that, I would ask Richard one question regarding the, de the definition of recognizing operating agency. So this means that uh, over the top are recognizing operating agency should be should be in the list of the recognizing operating agency? This is the first question. The other one, to both to you and to Franklin, is uh, regarding IP interconnection, because one of the major, the, the major issues re related to the Ethno proposal is, is linked to the IP interconnection. Now, Jeff, according, unfortunately for us, again, to the EU framework, which exists, and we have to follow rules, in Europe, IP interconnection is a telecom service. Right, so I would ask Richard, uh, what, how you see uh, the problem of the definition of IP interconnection? Whether whether IP interconnection is a telecom service or is a, is a, is something different? And also uh, this to Franklin. Thank you. Uh, there were several people put up their hands who would like more and more, I think. But uh, before we go to the floor again, also Vint asked to be put in the queue. Would you like to come in now? Well, actually, now that you've asked your questions, I, I was going to uh, respond to something else. I actually think that the model that we are actively using today in the Internet is as close to a private networking model as one could get. IP interconnection is really a matter of two private operating companies who wish to connect their computers together. We'll call them routers for a moment. And they acquire dedicated telecommunication services to link the computers together. That's all they needed. They didn't need anything else. And to, to the thing that worries me more than anything is that when we talk about having high-level principles, that sounds good on the surface, except that the higher level you go, the more ambiguity there is. And the potential for introducing language which can now be interpreted or misinterpreted in ways that are potentially hazardous. So although I accept the idea that high-level principles are a good thing, I do worry about the specifics and about what things are defined in those principles and to what do they apply. Thank you. I will ask uh, both you, maybe, but first to answer the questions, but maybe first we go to the floor to have a few voices from there. There's a lady in the front row. She is a professor from the University of Delhi. Please, uh, Subi Chaturvedi, please. Thank you, Marcus, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. This is really my first IGF, and I feel a little overwhelmed. So I'll start with an existential question. Thank you, Bill. I'm a huge Tarantino fan, so you remind me of Crazy 88 every time you say 88 in the treaties. Well, um, so my first question really is, what is it that's broken that we're trying to fix? Um, I'm also a little confused because for me, and a platform or, or a room where I can't be in um, and there's no way that I can get in there which is going to decide and we began our discussion with the intervention that uh, public policy needs to be for public good and it needs to take into account people whose lives are going to change as a result of that policy. So, um, so any discussion around the internet which is about open innovation, which is about permissionless innovation, um, where access, transparency and recourse are not an option, where I can't be represented, is worrisome for me. Uh, this morning also we had the Secretary General say that he's not trying to control the internet and documents that are put out by ISOC clearly indicate to the contrary. Alice has mentioned spam, network fraud and the attempt to define them. The moment we go there we're clearly making an attempt to go into the content layer and um, issues related to telecom I think the only that's that's been a great success story in India we just put put together the first India IGF where we've had a great multi-stakeholder experience and the issues if there are any related to telecom are clearly domestic issues so I don't know if when you go to a platform like the ITU how that helps the Indian citizen because I represent academia and civil society thank you Thank you, and needless to recall that we had a very vibrant IGF in Hyderabad in 2008. There was a remote participant, and then I see 
I see Khalid Fatal and uh, this gentleman there. Remote participant, please. Oh, the microphone. microphone. Can you microphone can you pass it back there to? Thank you. Uh, we have a question from remote participant Anna Olmos from Spain. Um, she mentions that the question of ITRs has become part of the IGF and could be considered an internet governance matter uh, now, thanks to this session. Um, how can the IGF help or channel the multi-stakeholder community to impact the result of the WCIT or the final shape of the ITRs? And that's somehow related to a question at the front. Thank you. That's a good question, but that's basically what we are here for. We're trying to discuss this, also to raise awareness and to have a enlightened discussion, which is hopefully fact-based. But uh, let's go around. I think Khalid, Sahid, and this gentleman there, please. Microphone, can you pass it back? Um, thank you very much uh, for the microphone. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, First of all, Khaled Fatal, uh, Group Chairman, the Multilingual Internet Group. I think our journey since the uh, WISIS has uh, gone for m a number of years, and I recognize many of the faces, and, and I'm sure many of the faces who have been there for a long time will recognize uh, uh, the same thing. I want to ask the panelists maybe to reflect, and maybe a bit of wisdom, not just the facts, because we're now talking about a threat to a supposedly a system that works, correct? Now, wasn't this issue dead and buried in 2005 when the WISIS <laughs> closed shop, so to speak? And I ask, if it's really working as well as it is, why is there still that threat? And I put it to you, we have not, as well, we have not done as well as we should have. And I think we need to reflect. For example, um, Today, we talk about the multi-stakeholder model that works for everyone. Yes, there has been tremendous innovation, but the innovation has only served few. We look at, the, for example, the ICANN new GTLD process, which we were heavily involved in and continue to be in, and we supported. A portfolio of five groups have more than, uh, in their house, so to speak, more than 1,200 applications. Google are a major player. You look at the percentage of IDN applications that came into that space, and it's less than 5% of the total application. There's a multitude of what I would call things that could have been done better. And then I take you to back to the early days of 2003, 2004, when back then we alienated governments that they had no place into the process and tried to let them know that this is now how it's going to be. And I think back then, had we made it a bit more cordial, more respectful, and perhaps going back to the issue of the dinosaur today, we would probably not have been facing the threat again. And I, point, I leave you with the thought, keep in mind that we need to reflect not only what works, but how it could have worked a lot better, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you. Can you pass on the microphone right to Zahid? Yes, please. Hi, uh, Zahid Jamil. I'm from Pakistan. I just wanted to say that uh, I've been sort of in the uh, Arab region, in the UAE, etc., for instance, and I find that uh, the way the TRA, for instance, has tried to do engagement in the region uh, and being open to people for brotherly Muslim states, etc., coming there, not just government representative, but others, and also business sector has been an, uh, an interesting uh, change. I think that was something that, that I can say that I would definitely encourage. Uh, and this is in response to the question that, that was or comment made by the Indian lady from India, from New Delhi. And so I, I see that the Dubai government is trying to maybe be a little more open. I see that the ITU is trying to put some documents up for the first time, which is a huge change. What I would, you know, and, and keeping in mind the fact that uh, His Excellency uh, Muhammad Al Ghanim just made the point that he would like to see all of us in Dubai. I would imagine he would like to see us participate. I would just uh, ask whether he can confirm that all of us, whether we are part of a state delegation or not, can actually participate. Because that would be the leadership that has already been shown. Maybe that can continue. In, in, in December. I hope that is, and if that can be confirmed, that will be lovely. Thank you. Thank you. And can you pass on the microphone? Yes. And, pl and please introduce yourself. Okay. My name is uh, Ali Hussein, um, coming from Kenya. Um, I run a digital agency in Nairobi. Um, I think I'd, 
I really don't need to say the kind of multi-stakeholder arrangement that is going on in Kenya, which uh, I think is quite, uh, quite representative. But we find that at some point we tend, we tend to kind of push uh, the government side to come to the table um, and we've had we we have had quite a good uh, you know engagement the point that i'm trying to make is probably what jamil here has kind of said it's um it's almost kind of like a broken telephone record because we get to a point where we then have to let the official uh, team to go and kind of represent um, so that's one, you know, issue which uh, I'm really wondering what, where the forum is, where we can we can kind of get a lot more involved than we we currently are. My next uh, comment or question is probably to the gentleman there who talked about the European telco. Um, I think uh, from an African perspective, we. Um, We've, we've talked and agitated quite a bit about how telcos are rolling out new and new networks. Um, you find that, for example, in Kenya you've got four big uh, um, telcos um, in the mobile sector and you've got ISPs and each and every one of them is busy digging up the whole country. Um, and we've, I personally have tried to talk to them about an interesting American model uh, or word, new word called frenemy. Can these guys come together and become friend and enemy at the same time? Bring, bring all these networks together. Why does Safaricom have to? invest three billion dollars or three billion shillings in a different network airtel is doing the same thing then consumers are left to actually pay a huge amount of money so my question is is the telco model as we know it a really dead business model is is something uh, can they kind of uh, reinvent the cell themselves or uh, as Vince um, talked about here are we going to find ourselves being trampled by a collapsing dinosaur thank you we are risk of running out of time can we give a microphone to Bill Smith but that's the last speaker from the floor sorry, sorry. Um, Bill Smith from PayPal uh, first I want to I, I don't know that I have a question. I want to thank uh, Marcus for assembling such a great uh, panel. Um, we have academic scientists asking the typically proverbial and controversial questions, um, engaging with the audience and uh, the, um, the government representatives being diplomatic as they should be. Um, I guess the question is, uh, how will we bridge the gap between academia, civil society, science, business, and governments in uh, the wicket, because I, I think that is uh, what we need to do, um, and I believe I am hopeful that uh, we will be able to do that in the uh, the conference in in, uh, in Dubai in December. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to, uh, Bill. Could could you not walk away, but maybe give the microphone to the chairman of the conference straight away, uh, sir? Uh, would you like to say a few words and also answers? I think this is a. A good question. So maybe you're well placed to answer how we. I think the I, th I think the question that uh, was ad was uh, addressed to me regarding the participation of the of the different Sorry. parties into the into on, uh, into the conference. As you know, uh, the ITU has got a process. Uh, m member states they have their own accredi accreditation process, where uh, companies can participate along with their. Uh, through their governments and their and the delegations. So we see delegations that they have private companies with. UAE, for example, they, uh, we, we have private companies uh, participating with the, with the official delegations, including academia as well. So uh, uh, 
you guys have to go through your governments in terms of uh, the accreditation process that is approved by individual governments. I'm sure U.S., for example, they have lots of companies. They participate uh, under, the, uh, under the U.S. government. Probably some other countries, they do the same. Uh, so you have to go through, through that. But uh, we, we truly encourage, uh, you know, private sector, uh, civil society, as well as academia to basically be part of this process alongside uh, the governments in order to, uh, to give, uh, you know, to engage everybody in the process. So that's, that's my answer. Thank you. And the other question on how do you think we will be able to bridge the gap? How, how, do we, how are we able to bridge the gap as you will be chairing the conference? Would you have any comments? That's a good question. <laughs> Um, um, as I told you, we, we went through all the issues during the information meeting, the, fir the first information meeting. What we will be doing is uh, we are engaged now into, between, the two, the, between, between the six regional uh, groups in order, to, in order to focus on the issues that, of, that we know that is going to be uh, contentious in the conference. We will try at the, the first days to, you know, to basically get rid of all the issues that is agreed and focus on ne nine days on the issues that is contentious. Uh, we are hopeful that we will reach to a, con a, po a positive conclusion that will be anonymously, anonymously um, agreed by all parties uh, participating in the conference. Thank you. With that, I think I would like to turn to my panel and ask for final comments. Shall we just go from left to right and start with Bill on the very left? Thank you, Marcus. Thank you it's been much. a very interesting panel, and uh, I'm glad that we were able to pull this together. Um, <clears throat> I guess I just want to respond to the Indian colleague being the academic on the panel and the civil society person. Uh, um, I guess I would start by saying, with regard to participation, uh, I'm certainly an advocate of reforms that would allow all stakeholders to be able to participate uh, in all relevant international processes. Um, I would also argue that at the national level, much is to be done. I don't know if you've seen the Indian government's proposal for the work of the conference, but clearly, given what you've said about your predilections, I would suggest that you should engage with them uh, around these issues and, and bring to bear like-minded colleagues as well. Um, I guess I'll just leave it there. I, I, I won't bother with the, having provoked uh, Franklin. I, I, my only point was to say we would have the Internet irrespective, but that not having the barriers is different from enabling. So, okay, that's it. Thank you. Franklin. Thank you. Well, I'm finishing my words trying to respond here very quickly the, the questions uh, that were risen. Well, about uh, bridging the gap uh, on, the, on the wicket, I very much appreciate the information that has been brought about the possibility of companies taking part in the delegations, and I, I, I think this certainly is a very uh, clear sign that uh, the, the, the conference aims to reach other stakeholders. But, uh, uh, of course, I would like to offer the, the Brazilian experience, like I said. The preparation of the Brazilian position is being uh, made by a, a very open process where all the stakeholders are being heard. Of course, this is a difficult process, and at the end, some, uh, uh, some individuals or sectors will not be fully happy. But, uh, like, uh, I think it was JFK that said that uh, the path to failure starts to trying to leave everybody happy. So... <laughs> um, about if the telco model is uh, going burning out or, or not, uh, uh, e even if it, if, it, if this were true, uh, we know if you go back to our economic classes uh, years ago that the, the fundamentals of any economic system, uh, uh, apart from the currency, from the goods, from the natural resources, is the entrepreneurship. I mean, and this pillar will not be broken. I mean, even if this model is uh, is is facing. Uh, huge challenges and transformations, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, this uh, entrepreneurship, the, 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 the capacity and the will of the, of the, uh, of, of the uh, companies, they will, they will find a way to, to, uh, on, on this new environment. Uh, about how the IGF could help the, the, uh, 
the wicket process, I think this is an example. I mean, here we have the, the chair of the of the meeting listening from how we say from the horse's mouth many of the positions of the countries that will be represented in the in the conference. Then I think this capillarity that the IGF offers is uh, of great help for not only wicket but also for many other meetings. Uh, responding to the young lady from, from India, uh, assuming that your question has also to do with the ITRs, what, what is broken and must be, and must be uh, fixed, I, 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 like I said, from the public interest perspective, and especially regarding to Brazil, we consider that the current system of uh, rating, of tariff, of cost, may, uh, is very uh, in equals, uh, unequal, especially with the, uh, with the question of roaming. Then uh, in Brazil, many people, they travel abroad and when they come back, they have this, <gasps> when they receive their bills. When <laughs> so this is a, 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 a one matter of huge interest in Brazil, one of the aspects that we think could be fixed by the new ITRs. And responding to, 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 to Luigi, uh, I, I commend you for, uh, uh, Luigi has been very active in Europe, including in contact with the uh, Brazilian representatives in Europe, uh, specifically the question about the IP interconnection. Uh, like I said, our norm 4, it states that uh, services related to the Internet are added value services, then they are not uh, tariffed as telecommunications. Thank you very much. To all. It was a pleasure to be here. Franklin, Dick, uh, Thank you very much, and thank you again, Marcus, and, uh, for um, inviting me to participate. Um, let me uh, address specifically my friend Luigi's questions. Uh, the first question, are over-the-top providers recognized operating agencies from the U.S.? <coughs> Excuse me, from the U.S. perspective, the answer is no. Secondly, with respect to Internet connections, we see those as commercial arrangements, not regulated. On transparency, um, I think this is a very important point and is a theme of this conference. Uh, and it reflects the world that we now live in, and that's appropriate. The United States has approximately 103 participants in its delegation. It's, uh, it is evenly divided, almost, between private sector representatives and government. I'm pleased to say that Mr. Bill Smith of PayPal is a member of that delegation, <coughs> and Mr. Bill Drake, uh, from his uh, academic affiliation, is also a member uh, of the U.S. delegation, and we have conducted extensive consultations to prepare our positions, um, but I would encourage uh, you all, as you are maybe members of the civil society, to uh, participate in your national delegations and to come to Dubai. Thank you. Thank you for that. Bint? Just a short observation. Uh, I think that given um, the potential hazards, the smartest outcome for this wicket would be the most minimum change possible to the existing regulations until we can figure out how to make a real multi-stakeholder uh, deliberation happen. Uh, I don't uh, disagree that there are good inputs coming into national delegations, but in the end it's still governments that are in the driver's seat. And I don't mean that to be any personal consider, uh, um, criticism at all. I just think that if you're going to have a multi-stakeholder system, every stakeholder has to have an equal role to play. So I hope for a uh, very minimal uh, outcome to give us some breathing room to try to get this right. Alice? Um, uh, for me, it is to thank you again for organizing this, uh, this workshop. Uh, on transparency, again, mentioned the, f uh, the fact that the Kenyan government, uh, through the Communications Commission of Kenya, that's the regulatory authority that is coordinating our national position, uh, and it's the organization that represents Kenya on the ITU, uh, is already, has already made available uh, some of the documents and has made available the Africa Common Position uh, for Kenyan stakeholders to either agree or not so that we can develop uh, a, a Kenya proposal. So uh, f from a transparency perspective, that, uh, that is ongoing uh, and we're waiting to see before we come to Dubai, uh, we'll have probably developed a concrete uh, Kenyan position. But also to mention that uh, we have in, in Africa, communication networks deliver many types of services and uh, including the internet is one of them. And so uh, for us, all of these issues uh, presented by the Africa Common Position matter. 
uh, and not least because they impact on uh, investment in broadband networks. So it is in my opinion, in our opinion, that uh, it is unlikely, or I'm hoping, or we're hoping that it is unlikely that the outcome uh, of uh, the Wicked Conference is actually going to be detrimental uh, to, uh, to, to uh, consumers or, uh, or to the development of, uh, of the Internet uh, uh, in, in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. And Jeff? You know, as humans, communication is everything. It's what we are. What distinguishes our ability to communicate is everything, and the way in which we communicate alters our own society. The telephone fundamentally changed the world when it was introduced, and the internet is doing exactly the same thing all over again. It's changing us, our business, our economy, everything we do. You're in the middle of one of these dramatic shifts, a real revolutionary change. We have no idea how it's going to turn out. We have no idea what wins and what loses. We have a rough idea that putting copper in the ground is probably a loss. And we had a good idea that if you funded Mark Zuckerberg's flight from Boston to San Francisco or whatever, you're on a real winner. The wicket couldn't have come at a worse time, unfortunately. We are right in the middle of a massive change without a clear idea of true outcomes. These things are going to shrink further. Bandwidth is going to increase. What's happening will change. It's just software. The problem with a regulatory structure is that you're stuck with it for decades. They're difficult to get to agreement and they tend to be sticky. So we're asking from our delegations the ultimate in prescience, the ultimate in the ability to get just the right touch. What we have now is historic. And if we said right at the front, this is about the telephone industry and virtual circuits, we could all walk away and go, great ITRs, it's all about telephony, let's just walk away. But if we're going to get a set of regulations that carry us for the next two decades through all of telecommunications, then I think the best we could ask for our delegations is to get rid of Articles 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8. Is there 8? And just leave Article 1, which basically says... This is a really, really good thing. And as all nation states, telecommunications should be encouraged in every possible way because that's the way we as humans live, work, breathe and play. And if we just did that, we would have done enough and given enough of a goal. Because I think beyond that, none of us, industry, academic, scientists, none of us have any idea of precisely how the industry is going to play out in the next 10 years. This is the middle of a massive revolution. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will not try even attempt to summarize. I will say this was an extremely interesting discussion and I would like to thank all the panelists and above all Bill Drake who did much of the heavy lifting in for this panel participation and your attention and I would like to ask you to join me and give the panelists a big hand. Thank you.